I'll, I'll talk about um, work we've been doing within the group actually over the last few years. Um, the, the papers are in my Google Scholar profile and there is all the kind of co-authors and stuff. Uh, but this involves many, many members of the uh, Game AI group and, and other collaborators that we work with as, as well. Uh, yeah, so it's about evolutionary algorithms and Game AI. And I wanted to uh, give this talk in this way because I think that evolutionary algorithms uh, are really um, amazing and, and powerful methods. And I, I sort of think that um, they don't quite have their due place in, in AI in, in general. Um, so let me explain why, why I think that. So first of all, um, what I love about them is that they're really sort of powerful black box optimization methods. And um, they're, they're sort of really easy to apply and really easy to apply to a wide range of problems. And very often you can make progress with an EA with a few lines of code. Now that's not always true, right? So for some problems you try with them, uh, that the basic things really don't work and you have to do something cleverer. But for a, for a surprising range of problems, you know, if you give it a little bit of sort, uh, thought and apply a bit of insight, uh, the sim simple algorithms often work really, really well. Uh, so let me just give a, a couple of examples and I'll give some demos as we go throughout. So I, I think the brief was talk to talk for about 30 or 40 minutes and um, take questions at the end. But actually, if you get any sort of questions you want to interrupt me as we go through, that's, that's also fine. Uh, so the examples I'll give are going to be for uh, procedural content generation or, or game design, uh, game agent AI, I'll also mention a little bit about hyperparameter tuning, but I just realized I wouldn't have time to talk about this in depth. So I'll, as we go through, I'll just give a flavor of some of the things that we do with that. But first of all, I want to take an example. So uh, imagine that um, you've got the problem here uh, of designing a sort of maze or a, or a labyrinth type thing. And uh, this is going to be on a, a N by M grid. And uh, you want it to um, sort of be a little bit complicated to get through, um, perhaps have one route, perhaps have multiple routes. But it's a sort of class of problem where actually it's not at all hard to define a fitness function. So it's quite easy to measure the quality of a solution using various graph algorithms. And the example I've given here, I said I wanted the, uh, the longest shortest path between two points, if that makes sense. Uh, so the, the points are here and here, but you could pick them any, anywhere in the grid. And the objective of the algorithm is to uh, put wall cells, so the gray ones are walls that you, you, know, you cannot pass through. So the objective is to, is it like a binary search space where you've either got a yellow passable or a gray wall and just set each bit to be either wall or passable in order to optimize that criteria. So cri criteria is, uh, so the more convoluted the route is between A and B, the, the higher the fitness. And it's sim simply the number of steps that you take. And um, maybe there's no path at all, in which case uh, that doesn't count because you, know, you, you can't get from A to B. So actually we can see this running in a web browser. And it, if I ask you to design an algorithm to construct this, uh, you, you, you probably could. And this is the optimizer working now. So this is just doing sort of bit flip uh, optimizations. And you'll notice uh, initially the, the solutions are really, really poor. So these are really sort of short paths. But hopefully what's going to happen soon is that it'll evolve better solutions and the mazes get... Uh, more and more sort of convoluted. And it's quite easy to adapt the fitness function and to have other sort of criteria. So you can just apply different um, graph algorithms to it to measure the fitness in different ways. So maybe you select a number of paths you want or uh, whatever. But it's a sort of class of problem where it's quite easy to define a metric to measure the quality of a solution, but actually not so easy to design it. Um, yeah, so just, just a, a sort of simple example of a very simple form of PCG. Oh, and on, also on this webpage, uh, this is a game we'll see later called uh, Cave Swing. 
And uh, this is a sort of one touch casual game that I wrote and you've just got to sort of attach ropes to the things to swing through the cave. And here's an example of, um, we'll see Rolling Horizon uh, evolutionary algorithms playing this game. In fact, that's, uh, that's what's operating behind the scenes. But uh, later on, I'll give a bit more insight into how it works. Oops. Uh, okay, so I'll be talking about then uh, simulated evolution. And what I like about it is that it's it's really so, 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 so simple. So you start with initial randomly generated solutions. Uh, put randomly generated in question mark because actually sometimes we don't do them uniform random. Sometimes there's a good reason that you want to see the population in a particular way. And then you evaluate them. So you just check how good they are, basically. And then you're going to generate new ones by randomly mutating the best ones that you found so far. And then each time around the loop, you're going to replace the worst ones with the best ones. And we just repeat this, these three steps uh, many times. And we do it until we run out of time or until we've got a satisfy, satisfactory solution. And that's the, that's the essence of it. Um, so I think they're, they're very general, very powerful, often work surprisingly well out of the box. And there's plenty of scope also for innovation. So I, I like that too. You know, it, it would be kind of not so much fun if the algorithm was just there, like sort of quick sort, and there's nothing you could do with it. Uh, but actually, one of the things I like about EAs is that although the, the kind of core of the algorithm is simple, there's scope for innovation in, in pretty much every aspect of them, in how you initialize the population, in how you do the evaluation and selection, and in how you do the variation as well. Uh, a lot of people who come to EAs from um, the, there's some old books on the subject, like uh, David Goldberg's book on genetic algorithms. Uh, books like that sort of stress the importance of crossover operators. Uh, I, I really don't agree with that. So when you cross over, the idea is you have multiple parents, ju just like in biological uh, evolution, you know, for, for the largest part. And you've got to work out how to combine the solutions. That just kind of complicates it, and often it makes things worse. So usually mutation works works just fine. Uh, so actually, uh, I want to try and give some insight into why these things work so well. Uh, so very often we're doing search in, in really large search spaces, and it might seem a little bit daunting. So let's take an example. So here's a, an image. It's a 200 by 200 binary image. So it's got 40,000 pixels in it, and each one can be black or white. So how many possible images are there of this type? And the answer, of course, is two to the power of 40,000. So the search space is 40,000 dimensional. And um, the number of possible distinct solutions are two to the 40,000. Uh, so it's a lot, right? So it's a big number. Now, why can we search this so well? Well, let's do um, some evolution. Now we're going to evolve it with a fitness function is going to be how well it matches a predefined image and see how quickly you can recognize it. So this is our Queen Mary logo. It's the uh, it's a Queen Mary crown. Uh, now you'll notice that it's not perfect at the moment. There's still some uh, noise in the image, uh, but actually you could recognize it if you, if you knew what you're looking for, you could recognize it ages ago. Uh, so the point that I'm making there, one of the reasons that these often work surprisingly well is that to begin with, if we start off a rand with a random solution uh, in many sort of search spaces, uh, we find that actually around about 50% of the time, making a random change improves things a bit. And so we start off on this sort of steep part of the slope. And then as things get better, as they get closer to uh, Optima, then many of the changes we make, if we just make random undirected changes, they're going to make things worse. And so they're quite poor at converging. So as we approach perfection, things really slow down. So, you know, they're really sort of great in this part of the search space. And they're really not, not great, to be honest, over here. Now, um, providing we don't aim to be optimal, what this means is that actually we, we may find good enough solutions quickly in really large search spaces. And maybe in game AI, that's quite often the situation that we find ourselves in. Because very often uh, for complicated games with multiple players and uh, plenty of things that we can't observe, uh, maybe um, searching for really sort of 
optimal things, it perhaps doesn't even make sense. We just want to find things that, that are good. Uh, okay, so with that sort of background, uh, we're going to just um, do some procedural content generation for a bit. Uh, so this is a paper that I worked on with a, a previous member of the group, uh, Vanessa Voltz, who's now with uh, Model AI in Copenhagen. Uh, so this was building on some previous work we did on using um, uh, GANs. So we used uh, uh, convolutional GAN networks to train them on uh, Mario levels. And then we did evolution in the uh, latent space induced by the GANs. And that worked pretty well, but it was quite slow. So maybe training the GANs uh, on the Mario levels um, took a little while, maybe took a couple of hours to train a GAN each time and then doing the evolution in the space was also, um, uh, you know, also a little bit slow. Uh, so what we did with this, we wanted to see if we could um, do something interesting using um, a fairly sort of basic evolutionary algorithm. Uh, so for this, uh, we've got the training data here, which is like a long strip of a Mario level. In fact, there's a standard data set for this. We describe it in the paper. And there are actually mul multiple levels. We just trained on one of them for this, for this work. And uh, it's just like a long strip that you, that you can see here. Uh, and then we've got to measure, we've got to develop a fitness measure. And so our fitness measure was to measure the uh, KL divergence between the distribution of tile patterns. So imagine you, you convolve a sort of tile sampler, uh, rectangular tile sampler over that entire training level. And you simply count the number of times that each distinct uh, set of tiles occur with, within a window of that size. Uh, so then to measure the fitness, you measure the uh, KL divergence between the, the two distributions, that is the distributions that you observe during training and the one that you observe during a test pattern. So for example, you might generate a, a set of random tiles and you measure the uh, diver KL divergence between those two things. Uh, now, one of the great things about this approach as well uh, we, there's um, the WFC, by the way, is called wave function collapse. Um, th this is a great, great piece of work, not, not done by us, but you can find uh, it on the web. And um, that's one of the things that inspired us to do this. And one of the interesting things about uh, these approaches is that you can do generation from really sort of tiny samples as well. So here we've got a four by four tile pattern that we want to uh, kind of tile a larger area with and we can use exactly this algorithm to uh, do that. In fact, that's one of the examples from the uh, WFC work. Uh, so what this is about, we, we use, um, we just sample all the tile patterns that occur in an um, N by M window, um, many, many possible choices. And of course you, you could use uh, uh, like a whole um, uh, set of these filters, but in the work so far, we just used uh, one each time and uh, here we'll show two by two and four by four. So they're all the distinct two by two tile patterns that we observed during training. And the sky pattern here is not surprising the most common. So in that training strip that occurred 2,100 times, uh, the least frequent ones just occur once or twice. And then if we observe four by four, then we get 570 distinct patterns. And uh, yeah. Uh, any any questions on this? So the, the idea is we're now just going to use evolution. We're going to um, mutate. We'll start off with a random set of tiles, and we're going to use mutation to um, to do it. I, I won't go into the maths. It's just standard uh, KL divergence, nearly standard. We've got to fix it by avoiding uh, divide by zero in, in certain cases. Oh, and one of the cool things about this, because it's asymmetric, uh, we can use a weight W to control uh, but basically what, what we do with the KL divergence here, we're using it to measure the uh, surprise that we see when we observe one of these generated uh, Mario levels. And we use W to control how much we want to uh, make sure that everything we see, we've seen before, versus how much we want to make sure that we don't exclude anything that we did see, if that makes sense. Um, so the evolutionary algorithm, my favorite one is the simplest one, it's a random mutation hill climber. 
Uh, so what we do, we repeat until we terminate uh, the mutated copy is a copy and mutation of the best one so far. And if it's better than or equal to the best, then it becomes the best yet. And if it's good enough, we terminate or run out of time. And so the, one of the reasons I wanted to include this is an interesting example where uh, if you didn't love evolutionary algorithms enough, you might just try it and just think, ah, it doesn't work. Because um, this is after 10,000 fitness evaluations uh, with a two by two window, and it looks nothing like a Mario level. It's terrible. And if we go up to four by four, it's even worse. So actually with a four by four window, we make zero evolutionary progress. Now, the reason for this is that we're using bit flip mutations, tile flip mutations, where each time we're just scanning along the level and uh, we, we flip a few things each time and say, is it better than before or as good as before, good or, than, or better than before? And if so, we accept the new one, otherwise we don't. And it doesn't get us anywhere. So this is a case uh, we've induced a super hard search space that with a standard mutation operator is just impossible to search. So you know, we just ask ourselves, can we, can we fix it? Uh, yeah, we can. So what we do now, um, we just use a convolutional window-based mutation where we're just gonna sample from the training set and just put these sort of chunks in random locations in the generated images, then this completely fixes it and it works pretty well now. Uh, so these are just shown the evolutionary traces. Uh, the lower ones are the ones with the standard mutation operator and this is with a convolutional mutation. And um, this also shows us the, the sort of asymmetry that we get. So with this one uh, in the top one, we're saying, uh, we want to make sure that anything we generate has been seen during training. So this kind of leads to very safe but boring levels. And then in the bottom example, we're saying, okay, um, this is like a fear of missing out one. Uh, we wanna try and make sure that every pattern we saw during training, we're, we're gonna bung it into the uh, generated level somewhere. And that tends to lead to more interesting levels. And then, yeah, it also works from tiny samples. Uh, so that's it for the for the first bit of PCG. Um, I, I guess I, I should probably crack on with the next bit. So that, that's just an example of using um, EAs for PCG. I've got a demo of that running. It just runs really, really quickly. And you can just throw new levels at it. The training's instant and you do generation generation super fast. I, I might be able to have time at the end to, to run it. Okay, so we're going to switch a bit now from doing procedural generation to... Uh, uh, doing game agent AI. So now we want AI that will play a game reasonably well. We're not necessarily aiming for superhuman. Um, it would be nice actually to have that, but very often we, we don't need it for many applications. Um, we might require other things. So we might want a diverse range of behaviors. We might want easily tunable behaviors. And with evolution in this context, we can we can certainly achieve that. Uh, so just to um, re recap, I think some of the really big breakthroughs in game agent AI have been deep reinforcement learning for sure. Uh, so some of the features of this, it tends to be relatively slow to learn, but fast to apply. So once you've trained the nets, uh, really, really quick to apply. Uh, level of performance, as, as we've seen with things like Alpha Zero and many other systems, often superhuman. Uh, question marks around the generalization. So quite often when you've trained one of these deep nets, if you change a bit of the game uh, or throw levels of it that it's not seen before, sometimes these things uh, struggle a bit. So what we work on a lot in our group, uh, simulation-based AI that we also call statistical forward planning. And the most famous example of this is Monte Carlo Tree Search. But I'm not going to talk about that, um, although I've got a picture of it there. I'm not going to talk about that more because I'm going to focus more on the rolling horizon evolution. But just, just to mention that MCTS is um, you know, very, very widely used in not just in game AI, you know, especially in game AI, but it, in many other types of AI. Uh, but rolling horizon evolution is uh, much less used, although we find it often offers competitive performance with uh, MCTS. Um, so to apply any of these things, we call them simulation-based AI because you need a model of the system. So you need a simulation model 
uh, we call it a forward model, some people call it a world model. And it's a model that you can advance forward reasonably rapidly. Um, so we have a kind of rule of thumb that we'd like to make probably about a thousand steps in the model for each um, decision we make in the in the real game. So the key things that you have to focus on when you do this, when you implement a game, uh, you've got to be able to take a copy of the model. So the idea is we'll take multiple copies and we'll do um, sort of random simulations in each copy. And then for each copy, we've got to be able to call this next function in order to simulate the uh, consequences of our actions. And then things like the number of actions available, the score, is it terminal? They're, they're pretty straightforward. You, you get those with any digital game. But uh, ju just to mention that if you implement a game without taking any care, the um, the copy and next, well, next, as a, as a good programmer, you want to make that fast anyway. But if you're not careful, the copy one you can come unstuck with. So the basic idea, this is this is how it works, right? Um, we're going to generate a sequence of actions. Uh, now, these are normally sequences of integers, but they could be other things. They could be vectors of, they, they could be lists of vectors of floating point numbers. Uh, that, you know, we, we can evolve any of these things, really. For nearly all of what we do, we tend to use sequences of integers up till now. Although, actually, in some of our tabletop games, they could be more, more complicated uh, objects. So the idea is uh, you generate a sequence at random. Uh, you observe the score difference that this leads to. Uh, let's say this one led to a 200, gain in 250 points. Uh, then try some mutations. Uh, here we can see that turn left change and turn right. Oh, well, that gained 350 points. So let's go with that one. Uh, the actions can be anything in the game. The algorithm doesn't care at all. Uh, so let's see, let's see a demo of this. Um, so go to my. Is it going? Uh, yeah, so uh, we're going to run the the asteroids demo. Da, 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 da. Uh, what I'll do first, um, I'm just going to change the the sequence length. So the sequence length is how far we're looking into the future, how many game ticks we're looking into the future on, on each um, on each of these uh, sequence evaluations. So the pink lines on the ship, that's showing a projection of where the ship expects to be as the sequences roll out. Now you can see that this is this is not playing very well. It's actually a little bit better than random already, believe it or not. Um, although on that particular trial, uh, it possibly, possibly wasn't. Uh, we're just going to change the sequence length now to look further ahead. Uh, now this is um, this has gone a bit slow and laggy. That's actually because I'm on a Zoom call and the the laptop's just sort of struggling with compressing the video and doing it at the same time. It actually runs. If I'm just on my laptop, it runs really smoothly without without any lag normally. So let me just talk you through what's what's happening here. So the pink lines are showing the kind of distance the ship is going to travel uh, during each of the rollouts, and you can see as they spread out, it's considering multiple possible futures. It's actually considering 20 possible futures. And on the graph on the left, what we're seeing here is the expected score that each one of those is going to lead to. And uh, you can see it's just clear the level, which is pretty, pretty good going. Uh, so all it's doing, it's considering all those possible futures and evolving them uh, as, as we go. But to make each decision, it's just going to find the thing that turned out best and just take the decision at the start that led to that. But it's not going to throw the solution away. It's going to shift it along. So think of this as like a shift buffer. So we just take the first action, shift the others along, then add a random action into the end. And that's basically, basically how it works. Uh, so yeah, so that, that was the Asteroids demo. Now, the, the great thing about this is that the same approach, it, it just works well across a really, really wide range of games. And if it doesn't work well enough, we're not stuck. So within this overall framework, we can apply 
policy and value functions uh, very easily. So what I've done is uh, all the places where you can put in a policy function, like a like a queue function to choose an action, uh, I've put in yellow, and all the ones where you can put a value function, which will evaluate, give a sort of estimated value of being in a particular state, I've put in green. And so we can take the basic algorithm, so we have this best sequence, random sequence of length n. It doesn't have to be random, right? We can generate it through a policy. Uh, so um, like a biased random one. Then for each decision in the game, uh, we'll say the best sequence to start with is uh, a shift and random append for the best sequence. But again, it doesn't have to be random. It could be a policy choosing that uh, appendage. And then for the number of evaluations we're taking, uh, we're going to take a mutation of the best one. Again, it doesn't have to be random. It can be a policy informed mutation. And then the score we apply, uh, it doesn't have to be the default game score. It can be some uh, value function applied to that. And so we can use any sort of deep learning method we want or any any learning method we want to uh, to make the algorithm stronger in this way. Uh, even the sort of basic stuff, uh, rolling horizon evolution, we, we found uh, on Pomerman, which is a, a nice uh, competition run for NeurIPS 2018. Uh, we found that these are quite competitive, actually, with the deep learning methods that have been submitted to the competition. Uh, we've got a whole other paper on that, which is uh, outlined here. Uh, so now, I said I mentioned a little bit about the um, hyperparameter tuning. So the algorithm does, uh, yeah, whenever we do these AI algorithms, they nearly all have some parameters to tune. Uh, so very often um, we're, we're talking about uh, you know, like handfuls of parameters, maybe five, 10, 20, 50 parameters of tune. And so the question is, how do we set these? So for rolling horizon evolution, we, we have things like, uh, should we use a shift buffer or, or not? Uh, nearly always it makes it better, but actually not quite always. Sometimes it makes it worse. Mutation strength, what should that be? So how many bits in the string should we flip each time? Uh, how many rollouts we make per move? Uh, should we resample it? So some of these games are stochastic and maybe one rollout is going to be really unrepresentative of that action sequence. So maybe we should resample it multiple times. Uh, actually, that turns out to be really the case. Normally, we're best off for a given budget of just uh, taking one sample. Uh, rollout length. Uh, how far in the future should we look? Depends a lot on the game. For a lot of these arcade style games, um, uh, rolling out 100 steps, it just works great across an amazing range of games. Uh, but for some games, for our tabletop games, um, may, maybe we want to have it really small, like three or four or something. Uh, discount factor, so are we going to discount future rewards to, to value them less than immediate ones? Uh, opponent model, what should we set this to? Uh, so for multiplayer games, we've got to make up what the opponent's going to do as well, of course. And um, policy bias, for if we've got a policy to plug in. So the, the question is, how can we tune these? And so a few years ago, we developed our own method for doing this. Um, it's called uh, NTB, and uh, we have some papers on it. Again, ju just go to my scholar profile and uh, you'll, you'll find them. Uh, so it stands for Entable Bandit Evolutionary Algorithm. And it's, um, if any of you do hyperparameter optimization and you're familiar with uh, methods like um, uh, what's it called? It'll come back to me in a minute. Anyway, it's one of a whole sort of range of possible um, uh, ways of tuning hyperparameters. Uh, but we find it's, it's quite competitive with um, the state of the art. But it's very fast, it's relatively simple, and it's um, very informative. So you get a complete report about the parameters. Uh, let, let me explain basically what it does. So it uses bandit based sampling. So it uses a uh, uh, upper confidence bands algorithm to decide which point in the space to sample next. So to begin with, uh, and at the moment it just applies to discrete search spaces. So if you have continuous parameters, you have to first discretize them. And then basically we just start sampling and we record the fitness of each point, put it into the model. And for each parameter that we're sampling, in this case, we've got a, we've just got um, one parameter. This is the uh, sequence length. And we're trying to work out the best length to set and um, it's a stochastic game or stochastic agent each time we try something we, we can get different results so the red ones are the the actual fitness of each one and the green bar is the mean and the blue one is the exploration factor so how much we should 
uh, value exploring something that we haven't seen much yet. So you can see, for example, this one here of a length equals two. This seems to be pretty terrible compared to the others, but actually we probably only sampled it, well, in fact, four times. So the blue bar is quite high telling us we could sample it more. Now, at the moment, I've just shown this in, in one dimension, but actually we just apply this same sort of um, bandit-based sampling up to um, uh, in sort of n-dimensional spaces. And we do it by building models uh, for each um, dimension individually, for each pair of dimensions, let's see, two tuples, and um, <clears throat> sometimes also three tuples, and then the whole interval of recording the fitness of each complete uh, vector. Uh, so that's the, the basic idea. It works, works uh, qu quite well. Uh, we've got a couple of um, versions of this on, on GitHub as kind of standalone libraries, if you want to try them. Uh, so when we do this tuning, it's really interesting. Um, so uh, th this is stuff we evolved for, for Planet Wars. I mean, by the way, um, the reason we have to have that bandit uh, complexity is for these really noisy fitness functions. So if you use a simple evolution, when the fitness function is, is noisy, it, it really fails quite uh, badly sometimes. And so that's why you're better off using a model-based approach. And but by model, I mean statistical model of the search space in this case. Uh, so uh, these are what came out of those parameter tuning. Um, so user shift buffer, uh, yeah, that, the, the mutation strength, for anyone familiar with evolutionary algorithms, um, a mutation strength of 20%, that, that means we're on average flipping 20% of the bits each time we make a mu mutation. Uh, this is just amazingly high. And um, this has sort of helped give us more insight into how the algorithm works. And it's, it suggests that we're on the kind of steep part of that evolutionary slope when we're doing this. Uh, Enry samples often comes to one, Ronalds per move 20, okay. Run at length 100, pretty typical. Discount factor 0.99. And uh, yeah, they're the sort of main things. And uh, the same algorithm, this is, uh, this is Planet Wars. In fact, that's what that run was, was based on, I think. And this is a two player game. And again, the same algorithm with very little tuning, perhaps even with no tuning, it just works straight out of the box with this, with maps of any size. So you get, uh, for game AI, you get amazing generalization. Uh, so the, the summary of the rolling horizon evolutionary approach for this is uh, this is a relatively explainable form of AI because to explain the actions, well, you can watch the simulated outcome and analyze the stats. It's tunable, so you can tune the sequence length for the short night sightedness or you know, long sightedness of the agent, tune the intervals for the thoroughness, uh, tune the shift buffer for the consistency. Uh, yeah. And the different algorithms actually have uh, different behaviors. So. And I, I just want to just about finish off with an example in, in game tuning. Uh, so this is, um, this is Cave Swing. It's a one-touch casual game. And um, when we design a game like this, we end up with a bunch of parameters. And this is the uh, parameters of the game. So maximum ticks, how long is the game going to last? So it's a casual game. Some of these games, we want to limit them to, to be really short and uh, make, make it so that people can play really, really quickly when they've just got maybe half a minute. Uh, we want to tune the, the gravity, which is a vector because we can have backwards sort of horizontal gravity as well. Uh, we're going to swing through the cave. So we tune Hooke's law, uh, loss factors like air resistance, similar kind of. Uh, the width and height of the window, the number of anchors to swing from, the mean anchor height, and then score related parameters and so on. So we bunch, end up with a bunch of things to tune. And then we're just gonna define the fitness function as being the score of a skillful agent uh, using rolling horizon evolution, uh, minus the score of a random agent or mediocre agent, perhaps an untuned uh, rolling horizon agent. And then we can run this and um, we can evolve now new games, new versions of the game that are going to be playable because uh, we've evolved them to be playable. So we've evolved there to be a skill gap between an unskilled and a skilled agent. And um, yeah, we, we use the NTB to do the optimization. And uh, I, I quite like this example because we're using Rolling Horizon to control the skillful agent. And we're using the NTB type of evolutionary algorithm to optimize the, the game parameters. And when we run this, 
uh, we don't need to run it to find the optimal. We, we often just want to find a kind of good solution. And each time we run it, it ends up with a sort of diverse and interesting uh, kind of solution. Uh, this one here uh, is a very, very narrow one. And it's, um, don't mean narrow, I mean like a, like a very low ceiling one. And it's kind of fun to play. So it's uh, one I probably wouldn't have designed by hand, but it's still one that's playable. And um, yeah. Uh, so some open challenges, uh, handling combinatorial action spaces is, is, is still kind of tough. Uh, so there's a really nice example of this um, called Bot Bowl. It's a version of Blood Bowl, which is like an American, well, it is an American football sim. And in uh, Bot Bowl, it's one designed for these AI competitions. And it's kind of interesting. So the branch, in fact, is about 10 to the 50, because on each step, you control each of your players and you tell them, what path to follow. So there's a kind of underlying grid. And um, yeah, it's, it's pretty tough. So out of the box, Roland Horizon doesn't handle this well. Uh, I think learning practical and useful opponent models, collaborative models, this is pretty tough. Um, going higher than two players is also quite, quite hard. Doing sample efficient learning is hard. Uh, if we don't have a forward model that's convenient, uh, then learning world models is, is hard and interesting. Some amazing progress things like mu zero, but still um, much, much more to do here. And then also um, hierarchical planning and, and abstract models. I, th I think lots of, uh, lots of stuff to do. Uh, I just want to mention our tabletop games framework. This is something we're developing in the group. So one of the unexplored region areas, I think of game AI is uh, multiplayer games. And by multi, we mean more than two players. And we've got this framework that helps us explore this with all these games already in it. And um, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll sort of stop there and take any take any questions. So evolution, then I would say many applications, game AI, uh, Rolling Horizon works really well across a really wide range of games. And if there's time, there's uh, one or two more demos I can show. Uh, we've also done some tests with the Ford model, so it doesn't need to be perfect to be useful, and that's that's quite interesting. Uh, real world applications, they're often really messy. There's no need to be optimal, and um, there's lots, lots more to explore in this area. And one of the things that's really exciting me at the moment is uh, Monte Carlo uh, graph search. Uh, I've actually misspelled it there. It should be MCGS. Uh, okay, cool. I'll, I'll stop there and take any questions. <laughs>